Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Sandeep Dillon. Um, thank you again for the, the invitation to speak. It's been a fantastic few days. Uh, I'm going to try and just wrap up uh, some of the themes. Um, you've kind of read, read who I am and what I do. Um, my, my background to a lot of this is I spent most of my life as a pre-hospital uh, general practitioner in, in the military. And I started at a time where we had nothing. Um, and one of my jobs was to look at over-the-horizon technologies that save um, lives on the battlefield and then try and put in place governance and other structures to get those in. Uh, often getting tips from, from people in this room um, about how we can stop clot clotting, how we can arrest hemorrhage and right the way through to trying to deliver blood products um, forward. So that's one area where I overlap with, with some of my colleagues that have spoken before. Um, I also enjoy climbing. I happen to be a bit of a freak uh, in that I perform extremely well at extreme altitudes without, um, without any training. Um, so uh, the hardest bit for, of medical school for me was trying to climb the seven summits while squeezing in uh, a medical degree. Um, I did manage to become the youngest person in the world to do that. The current record holder was sort of less than half the age I was when I did it. Um, but I found that, uh, that, that, was, that was really interesting, and the physiology that I was learning in medical school didn't work for me. It was all based around the 70 kilogram male at altitude, and as, got, as I got further involved in medicine, I started to look for parallels between the perturbances in your physiology that we experience at extreme altitude and any lessons we can take back uh, into people who are critically ill. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, this is the view from the summit of Everest reflected in one of my colleagues' glasses. Um, you can very clearly see the watershed. So you've got the high altitude plateau of Tibet um, to the north, and you've got Everest to the south. Um, I'm just going to show you the trailer to the, the, um, the IMAX Everest film, which remains their most um, popular and successful IMAX film. There is a place that is above of all others, a place where dreams are chased above clouds, a place where only the strong and lucky survive. The top of the world where the wind is fiercest is a desolate, deathly place where humans cannot live. Every breath burns the lungs like coal. I'm not sure what happened with the, uh, the sound there, but ended with a, an avalanche for, for Herman. Um, why, why would anybody want to go and climb Everest? Well, of course, Mallory gave the best answer, and it was actually on this series of an, been repeatedly asked about why would someone would try and do something that was, that was so ridiculously risky. Um, I've got a slightly different attitude to risk. Um, half of us in this room are going to get cancer. Um, probably about one in five of us are going to end up on intensive care. And I was quite lucky that as part of my training to be a GP in the military, I managed to wangle some time working uh, in intensive care. Um, and it was fantastic. We were trying to uh, look after people that were very severely sick. Uh, and I happened to be there with colleagues like Mike Grocott and Kevin Fong. And we noticed some similarities. And we thought, how can we exploit this? Um, what we wanted to do was to compare this person with, uh, with this person, um, but for reasons you'll understand, trying to do um, trials in intensive care on clones of critically ill patients who are there for different uh, pathophysiological reasons is extremely difficult. Um, what they did have in common, however, that they were all hypoxic. So we wanted to take 200 healthy volunteers, make them hypoxic by taking them up Everest, um, and we struggled a bit with the funding for that until we solved the problem by getting them to pay to be our guinea pigs. 
uh, and, and, it, and it actually worked. We needed £2 million. We got some funding from traditional um, medical um, funding bodies, but they weren't going to pay for rope and oxygen and everything. But these guys paid us a lot of money to be, to be tortured, which was, which was brilliant. Um, so that, that's what we did. We took people up there. Most of the work was done by the, the trekkers who arrived at, um, uh, at base camp, but I'm actually going to concentrate on, on some of the studies we did higher up the mountain because that's where you see um, some of the extreme um, results. We did a whole battery of tests. The, um, probably the most reproducible one was doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing. The worst iteration of this, we had a gastric tonometer. We had both radial arteries cannulated. We were doing lithium dilution um, cardiac output. Um, we had bilateral nears. We had muscles um, nears. And effectively, we had to cycle until we sac started sacrificing our, our gut circulation just to make sure that we were properly, properly hypoxic. That was probably the most evil thing we did. Um, to cut a long story short, we, we managed to get 25 people to the summit of Everest and back down safely, uh, which I believe is a, a British record. We put up a lab on the south col of Everest, which um, uh, is the highest lab in the world. And on the way down, it was a little bit windy on the summit, we managed to get some arterial blood gas samples um, from the femoral artery of, of four subjects, um, of, which, of which I was one of them. Um, so some of our results um, were fairly predictable. So this is looking at the, uh, the trekkers. So this is people going to base camp, 5,300 meters. And you can see that the changes that you would expect at altitude, so modest change in sort of hemoglobin by just over a point, uh, and the hematocrit sort of going up, uh, going up a little bit as well, but not, not that much. Um, and if you look at uh, the extreme team, so this was the group of climbers that stayed on the mountain for 75 days. You can see that the hemoglobin's gone up to near 19, and some of the summit climbers had hemoglobins of about 20. Um, that's going to cause problems, obviously, with um, uh, thrombophilia at altitude. Um, altitude itself is prothrombotic. We were doing tags on uh, some of these blood samples as well, um, uh, and it was shown there. And again, a hematocrit that's not going to be very conducive um, to good tissue perfusion. This, for me, was probably one of the most interesting results, and I'll, I'll take you through it. You've seen the Fick equation. And that's the bit that everyone ignores is the dissolved amount. But if you, if you look at London, you got, we had an average oxygen saturation of 19, hemoglobin of 14. That was the oxygen content of the blood. When we arrived in Namchi Bazaar, which is the sort of Sherpa um, base in, in Nepal, um, sats had dropped a little bit. Hemoglobin's gone up a small bit. We're only a few days out from London, so that could be dilutional. And the oxygen content has dropped accordingly. What was surprising is that by the time you trek to Everest Base Camp, the oxygen content of your blood is the same as it is at sea level. So your saturation's gone down, your hemoglobin's gone up, which, which is largely responsible for the compensation. Who in this room has had altitude sickness? Okay, so if you think back to it, it's not like being decompressed from an aircraft. Most of the cases of altitude sickness that I've seen happens some hours after you get there. Yet when you look at the, lead, the literature and the teaching on altitude illness, it says it's hypoxia. That's the sole reason for it. I would put it to you that hypoxia is the trigger for a whole bunch of processes that we don't understand that end up in the effects of hypoxia. Um, and you can see that um, by the time we left, um, our oxygen content was actually higher than it would be at sea level. Um, so, so what's going on here? Um, we've talked, um, perhaps talking yesterday about oxygen delivery. Other people have sort of mentioned it during the few days. Your performance in the mountains isn't associated with oxygen delivery. Um, so these were the two uh, gentlemen who first climbed Everest without supplemental oxygen. And the assumption at the time was that they were, they were just elite athletes. They were freaks of nature. Uh, and they had a whole battery of tests that were, um, were done on them. Um, and if you look at one in particular, their VO2 max, and you compare it with sort of non-climbers, completely normal. So they didn't have supranormal VO2. So they weren't 
So Hamler and Messner weren't able to climb Everest without supplemental oxygen because they had increased oxygen delivery. If you look at what, um, if you follow that Fick equation through to the rest of our results, um, you can see, if you just concentrate here, the arterial content um, of your blood is pretty much preserved to around 7,000 meters. For most people, that is extreme altitude. Um, most people would not enjoy going to 7,000 meters, yet there's no physiological reason based on oxygen content that they can't do that. So something else is going on. And the interest that we had from that is, if that's happening in the mountains, what's happening in our patients who are on 15 litres of, of supplemental oxygen, who have peripheral oxygen saturations in their 90s, and have fantastic oxygen content, but they're still critically ill, and they're still dying. The caveat for the rest of the talk is it's, it's just my punt at what I think might be going on. Most of this work has been done by um, the Caldwell Extreme Everest team and a huge number of international collaborators. Um, but these, these are just some of my thoughts. If I was to get involved in an avalanche now, why would I die? Why would I die in an avalanche? Why would I die if I got hit by Richard's car? Why would I die if I had a battlefield injury that we heard about yesterday? Why would I die if I had the bloody airway scenario we saw on the first session? What unites all of that? Sorry? So what's hypoxia? At the brain level, anyone else? Which bit of your body uses oxygen? Mitochondria. And we don't have any tools to investigate mitochondria. And everything that we're doing, you know, with, with great intent is we're measuring things at the macro level and making assumptions about what's happening at the cellular level. So, um, this is me sitting, sitting around uh, on Everest. I've got an oxygen saturation of 56. I'm perfectly happy. My heart rate's 108, which is probably what it is right, right now. Um, so let's do some. You're all familiar with this. But the point I'm trying to make is that we stop measuring what's going on here, and this is the business end of the oxygen cascade. And I think we need to know more about this, and I'm just going to take you through some of the things that we found and some potential areas for, for future research. Um, for me, this was a bit of a sort of William Harvey moment of, of my generation. He managed to see blood flowing in vivo. We use side stream dark field microscopy to image um, individual capillaries uh, sublingually. Each of these black dots is an erythrocyte passing through a capillary in the microcirculation. So we can try and play that. It should play automatically. Okay, these, these aren't going to play. There are some more later, um, and they're better quality. But this is, this is the sort of technology that we had available to us in 2007. And at sea level, you'd see quite good flow. Um, at 6,400 meters, you're seeing a combination of stagnant flow and some hyperdynamic flow. So it begins to give you an idea um, that the microcirculation isn't working. Um, this, is, uh, this slide's courtesy of, of Malcolm Russell, who, who many of you will know, medical director of Kent, Surrey and Sussex Air Ambulance. He was using an in-spectra um, tissue oxygen monitor to look at um, whether that might be any use in his helicopter emergency medical system. <laughs> this story is, a, uh, I think, a lady in her 50s who tried to kill herself, and this monitor is attached after ROSC. Um, and what you can see is that it starts dropping, and, and the critical oxygen tissue saturation seems to be about 70% borne out through a number of studies. This starts dropping, and it prompts a check for causes. Um, you then find out that there's no pulse, 
start CPR, and again, round about 50, you get ROSC again. Um, what then happens is it returns to normal, um, it starts dropping, a bit of epinephrine is dribbled in. During this phase, the patient is um, intubated, transferred to the helicopter, put onto positive pressure ventilation, and packaged for flight. They then start dropping again, and the, the thinking process that Malcolm had was a bit more epi, worked last time, it might work again this time. It carries on dropping, which prompts him to check other things. Then see that the airway pressure is coming up a bit, prompts him to do a needle thoracic entesis. Thoracic entesis, I can't remember it. Pops back up again during the flight, it drops again, and you're all aware of how difficult getting reliable monitoring of anything is, is in flight. And once you're down in, at this area, then the, your um, capillary, your, your peripheral oxygen saturation is not going to work, your blood pressure cuff is going to be cycling, you're not getting information. Um, anyway, down here, he decompressed the chest with, with a good result, came back here, uh, and when it dropped again, he just checked the chest and put two fingers, two glove fingers into the, uh, the thoracostomy holes. So it was an adjunct. Other, other services have looked at this, um, didn't really find that it helped. Um, and that's not really the point of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk to you about a particular piece of kit. I'm just trying to talk to you about principles that I think would be useful to consider sort of going forward. Um, this uh, was a study published in 2009, so around about the same time that Malcolm was doing his work. Um, it's actually a study from 2005, a combat support hospital in Tikrit. Um, so they, they put it on, they only got good data on, on about eight patients. Um, and I've picked, I've picked a couple of them. Um, in red, you've got the systolic blood pressure. Um, in green, you've got the heart rate. And in blue, you've got the tissue oxygen saturation. Um, on the bottom, you have time, heart rate here, SBP there. And here are the interventions. So they were using it to, to see if it could triage whether somebody was going to need critical interventions. And as we heard from Phil Spinella's talk yesterday, when you're in a resource poor field hospital, then being able to anticipate what you're likely to be able to deal with might make the decision between, actually, we can't cope with this, we've just had two of those in, overfly us to somewhere else, if you have that luxury. Probably not in, in Tikrit. Um, and and what, you can, what you can see is that the, um, the systolic brush, blood pressure does what it does. The interventions are go to the OR, go to ICU, get some uh, fluid resuscitation, including blood products. But to me, the tissue saturation more accurately reflects the changes in heart rate that represent the physiological response to either something getting worse or getting better. Um, I think particularly, particularly if you look up here, um, once they sort of open the abdomen and get control, um, you know, you can see that changing sort of quite significantly. Tissue oxygenation shoots up, heart rate returns to normal. They've got control. The blood pressure didn't really change that much at that time. It went up, so not really, not really helping you uh, as much. Um, this is just um, another case of somebody who, again, had one, has some packed red cells, goes into ICU, and again, it's the reflection. So it mirrors, um, it mirrors blood pressure quite well, but I think more importantly, it reflects heart rate. Um, this, was, uh, this was a study in Pittsburgh um, where they were, uh, they did it over nine months, looking at about 150 uh, patients, I believe, and again, they used it to predict whether someone would go on to need a life-saving intervention. So again, potentially um, a triage tool for, for pre-hospital EMS. Um, with their, this is their sort of rock curve, and as we heard yesterday, we're on the right side of the line. So it's possibly some <coughs> predictive value from using um, this sort of system. Um, if you look at what their predictors were, they found a number of them. They looked at sort of the lowest systolic, um, the desaturation of, of O2 and, uh, and GCS, and the p-values the p aren't, aren't, aren't too bad. Um, the newest iteration uh, of, of these sort of technologies is something uh, called the Cytocam. Um, it's been used to uh, look at patients in real time while they're sort of having ECMO to try and predict what's going on. 
Um, so in this study, you can read it for yourselves, but they looked at 24 people, 15 survived, 9 died. And these are the videos that need to work. This is a survivor. Um, I, it's not projecting brilliantly. If anybody wants to see it afterwards, I'm happy to show it to them. But you can see a nice dynamic blood flow. That's someone who didn't make it. And you can hopefully see the sludging here. So the microcirculation's not working. The microcirculation's not working, then all those red blood cells carrying 100% oxygen are just going around in circles, and they're not getting to the mitochondria. Um, there are some trials going on where we're trying to, people are trying to look at, well, actually, what are the parameters that might make any sense here? Com coming back to, um, to our study on Everest, um, you can see uh, this is our VO2 max dropping, and it actually drops fairly proportionally to the inspired partial pressure of oxygen. Um, so in, in simple terms, at Everest Base Camp, your VO2 max is half that at sea level, uh, and on the summit, it's about a third. So it's not, not quite a linear uh, relationship, and that reflects what happens with, with barometric pressure. Um, you've seen this, and I'm just going to talk you through... Uh, the gases, that's just to remind you that up to 7,000 metres oxygen content is preserved. Um, this is quite fun. These, these are some gases that we did on each other. Um, you've got PO2 on the bottom and PCO2 here. And you can, I'll just take you through it. This is sea level. Uh, that's assuming a critical uh, PO2 of about 8. Um, this is now um, at Everest Base Camp, 5,300 meters. Um, getting up into Advanced Base Camp in the Western Coombe at 6,400 meters. Um, this is on the Low Sea Face. That was quite an interesting place to, to try and do a blood gas. It's, it's reasonably steep. People fall down it. Um, and these are, the, these are the results that we're really proud of. So these were taken at 8,400 meters we had PO2s of between 2.2 uh, and sort of 4.4, and as far as we were aware, we were functioning normally. Um, these gases were taken, uh, taken off oxygen. There's video of us um, uh, doing the intervention, taking a separate anticubital venous sample so that we wouldn't be accused of uh, making a venous stab and relaying the results down to, um, uh, to the lab. Uh, just a quick aside on performance, it took us two days to get down from, from this place. Um, we'd practiced putting these samples in a, in a flask with a nice slurry, and we were reasonably happy with the machine that we had, that we had about six hours before this, we lost the validity of the sample. So we gave it to our best Sherpa and said, you need to get this down to Camp 2. He did it in two hours, having stopped for a cup of tea. So... <laughs> If anyone ever tells you they climbed Everest, unless they did it by themselves, they're lying. They, they, the Sherpas did all the work, and they crawled up behind them and took some hero pictures at the top. They are, they are phenomenal and, and uh, absolutely fantastic companions. So this is the next bit of the story. This is the story of our evolution over four and a half billion years. And for most of that, this is the oxygen content. For most of that, we've been completely anoxic. Um, we actually had a massive, um, this thing's called the Great Oxygenation Event, and it was actually one of the mass extinctions that happened. But sort of back in the primordial soup, you had, uh, it was mainly sort of CO2, it was, everything was anaerobic. Until blue, get, blue, sorry, blue green algae came along, and the ancestor of mitochondria was probably something akin to a rickettsial spirochete. And this opened the door to multicellular life because aerobic glycolysis is 100 times faster as well as giving you far more ATP. And all the stuff we've been talking about is just a reflection of that. So up to this point, it could all be done by diffusion. But I'd suggest the reason we have an airway and lungs and a circulatory system is simply that as we've got more complicated, we've got to have a more complicated way of delivering this oxygen to the mitochondria, which are now embedded deeper and deeper within our systems. So everything that you do is important, but this is the only place it sort of matters. 
Um, now, I hated mitochondria at medical school. It was a bit of biochemistry you had to learn. I quite like Karen Brohe's phrase that if you have to learn something every night before an exam, it means it's wrong. Uh, and you have, you know, they've, they've simplified it too much, they've got it wrong. And then he puts up something that's too complicated for normal people to remember anyway. Um, so if you're interested in mitochondria, this is quite a good place uh, to start. Um, just talks about the background of it. And, and Nick Lane's a really interesting evolutionary biologist that um, some of his other theories are that uh, life, uh, that cells, for, um, cells evolved in tiny cracks in underwater vents um, that were just the right size to allow a nucleus and other things to accumulate. So he's, he's a fascinating, uh, fascinating guy. So we thought, okay, we'd better look at mitochondria as well. This is really quite funny. Uh, this is Chris Imre, who's a professor of vascular surgery. And this is Denny Levitt, who's an anaesthetist, doing an open muscle biopsy on him at Everest Space Camp. Um, the reason we chose to do that is that previous studies of mitochondrial function at altitude had not shown any effect. But if you think about how mitochondria work, they, they, they would have instantly switched back to being in their normoxic state. Um, and we found a bunch of changes that I don't have to go into here, but effectively it feeds into all the stuff you're hearing about um, proteomics, about epigenetics, and all the other omics that are there. So there's dynamic regulation of protein expression. So apart from being a channel for oxygen delivery to mitochondria, the only other function you have is to produce proteins. So there's the two things that you do. You've got to get oxygen in and you've got to make protein. And the protein regulation is significantly affected um, by um, exposure to hypoxia. Um, again, there's just looking at the different types. I, I'm not clever enough to understand all of those, um, but I think looking at this is important. As you, if you start reading about mitochondrial um, biology, you will start to see that over the, ne the next few decades, more and more things will converge onto it. So you will see um, PAPA being mentioned in terms of cancer, in terms of aging. And I think we're going to, probably saying, probably hoping a bit too much. I think people have tried to find unifying common pathways for lots of things. I think the mitochondria have been neglected for a long time. And I think many disease pathways, the mitochondria will play um, a pivotal part. I'll talk about HIF1 alpha in a, in a second. Um, the other thing we did that was quite interesting is we did functional MRI of phosphate turnover in our hearts, um, which decreased. So my cardiac mass decreased by 11% during my trip to Everest. Um, thankfully, it came back within six months. And we started thinking, why would you want to do that when you're trying to increase your cardiac, you're trying to increase your oxygen delivery? And our theory on that is it goes back to the mitochondria again, that you're trying to get, in, and at altitude, you lose muscle um, in preference to fat. So our theory on that is that actually all you're trying to do is to sort of shorten the distances between your poorly perfused capillaries and your mitochondria by getting rid of anything excess in between. So your mitochondrial density actually goes up. You've got fewer of them, but the density goes up. Um, and I'll move. Uh, I'll move on. Let's just worry about that. Um, so I'm I'm a GP, and things have to be really simple to make sense for me. I also had to teach Pat Thompson, so I had to make things really really simple for Pat to understand it. Uh, and what what I mean by that is that. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a reductionist, uh, and, a, and a, a view I take is that biology is not wasteful. Everything happens for a reason. The reason why a juvenile snake is more dangerous than an adult snake is because it's, it's like any juvenile anywhere in the world. Um, if it feels threatened, it'll get aggressive. In the case of a snake, it'll deliver its entire venom sac in a bite. An adult snake is more likely to give you a dry bite because it takes weeks to make it. Um, snake venom is one of the most interesting concoctions of proteins, which is your secondary function. And it takes weeks for this snake to make that. So it's not going to waste it unless it has to. There's a quote that says that half the people that have ever lived, 
have been killed by an insect. Which means that throughout most of our history, the biggest threat to our existence has been infection. But we all know, because we see it in our patients, that our response to fighting infection is quite slow. And often the body's, the reason why, you know, one of the reasons we have people in intensive care is the body's um, immune response can't mount in time to fight off the infection. So if you agree that biology is not wasteful, you then come across this thing called hypoxia-inducible factor. And every time I look at it, it's responsible for a thousand more pathways that I didn't know existed. And when we first started playing in the mountains, no one knew what this was. We, we had... Um, there were certain factors and things out there. But what, what happens with HIF-1 alpha is your body makes this every second. Senses to see if you're hypoxic, and if you're not, it's cleaved. Now, I don't know of any other process in the body where we make something constantly just in case. And I don't know everything that HIF does, but I think, again, it's going to become more important, probably in a multitude of disease states. If we try and bring that back to hypo hypoxia, um, tons of effects, um, many of which you'll, you'll know. But again, the point here is simply we don't understand this. And we all, we all do what we, we all pick things that we're interested in or that affect our daily management of patients, quite rightly. Um, but I think we need to put some, in, some attention into what is the effect on the microcirculation of crystalloid versus whole blood? So all of the interventions and all the debates we've had today, I'd love to see a sort of a big sick conference in the future where people have sort of said, and the effect on the microcirculation of this intervention is X. Or using this, we have shown that the mitochondria are now working much better. We, we, we're getting there. Sorry, that's just... Um, that's the bit where oxygen's used. And what happens is NADH is, is, is um, uh, produced when it's not working. So we're now, we're now getting there um, in terms of having the tools to measure mitochondrial function in real time in vivo. When we did it, we had to take mitochondria, freeze them in liquid nitrogen, ship them back, and, uh, and have a look. In 2012, we managed to do some studies by taking samples and testing them at Everest Base Camp directly. But you can now, there are tools emerging that allow you to look at mitochondrial function in real time. Um, and uh, here they were doing it on, on pigs, and they were basically saying um, that it was more effective than tissue oxygen saturation. So tissue, if I'd have been speaking to you five years ago, I'd have been saying, we should really have a look at tissue oxygen saturation. Now I'm saying, we can really have a look at this. And in five years' time, someone will be saying, yeah, that was all old hat. We should be looking at something else. So I reiterate, I don't have the answers. I just want to challenge you. Um, this is one of the devices that's uh, out there. It's an Israeli um, device. It's looking at uh, sort of NADH as the marker that people have generally agreed on is a reflection of whether your mitochondria are working, working properly. Um, and, and what you've got here is you've got someone who's, who's normoxic. They then put them onto 6% oxygen and you see this rise in NADH. Um, and again, then they switch them back. A simpler way of trying to look at that is trying to work out, and, I, and I'm not going to go into redox states. There are, there are very clever people who can tell you about that, but it's not me. Um, but essentially, if your NADH is very high, that's not good. If it's low, it's better. Um, there's been some work, this was published I think last year, um, doing this in sort of uh, real time, trying to predict whether someone's going to have a cardiac arrest. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, again, this was done on a pig and they were trying to work out what's happening. They were applying for FDA approval to see if it'll get through. I think human studies um, for this technique are still some time away. Um, Sorry, I'm flipping around a bit. Um, but this goes back to so another thing. So I lost 22 kilos on Everest, which was great. Uh, and I probably need to go back. Um, <laughs> Dan also summited Everest. I, I go to Everest by not training, getting drunk every night on the way there, complaining about the increase of beer prices with altitude, which is linear. <laughs> um, 
Dan arrives, puts his head in his sleeping bag, and you can't see him for three days, and you think he's not going to make it. Six weeks later, we're both comfortably working on the summit of Everest. So the other big message here is that when we look at our patients, and Richard touched on this earlier, this phenotype doesn't equal genotype. So you can't make assumptions about what's happening inside someone's body or what's happening at their cellular level. A, by looking at them, but I'd also put it to you using some of the macro level tools that we've been accustomed to. And we've had the debate about the systolic blood pressure at 90 for, for, for ages, but you know, so what? Um, and, and the weight loss, um, the weight loss here again, I think is the same thing that I was saying with the, the heart, that it's about trying to get the mitochondria closer together. There was a point that was made, I think it was yesterday by the Thor group, that one of the drivers for what we do is somebody's sick, you have to do something. This is a study of, uh, so it's a survival curve in ITU. These are the people we do something to. And these are the people we leave alone and let their bodies sort it out. So you support them rather than intervene. I'm, I'm going to finish now. So I don't know the answers to any of this. I'm just, I'm just teasing you a little bit. Um, but I'm going to give you my own reflection on why, why we climb mountains that I do have an idea of. This is the summit shadow of uh, the peak of Everest being cast out hundreds of miles onto the horizon. You've been climbing for hours at night don't know if you're really going to make it. Suddenly you see this, you believe the Earth's going to curve, that the Earth does curve, and you might just get up and down safely. The other quote that Mallory had was far less well known, but I think far more poignant. And I'm going to end by letting you read that. I have to thank the organisers. I think they've absolutely nailed that spirit in this conference. So thank you very much. So while the next speaker prepares, we have time for a few questions. Okay. can't be a clever question. <laughs> no, so um, you say that, that at the altitude, you're actually wasting muscle. Um, yes. I'm, I mean, I would postulate that that would be because muscle is a, a tissue that is, is oxygen <coughs> demanding. So you, you're, you're actually reducing the need for oxygen at the same time. What about the brain? So we don't, we don't know in, 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 the, in the brain. We did, um, we did drop one professor's... Um, Nears down to about 30%, and he had uh, short term memory loss for about a month afterwards. Uh, and we did a lot of cognitive work, but I don't know what the. We don't have the tools to image mitochondria um, in, in, the, in the brain. And, you know, again, so fat, fat's got, got less mitochondria. You know, you don't. But, but the other part I'd say is the, the energy cost of climbing at extreme altitudes is actually quite modest. And it tends not to make. Um, for people who are climbing above 7,000 metres or so, you've got subclinical pulmonary edema when you're doing it. You're not like the people who are lower down who are getting really, really sick. And at the rates of work, the only rates of work we can generate, we're not actually using much energy. Um, so I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's just an energy thing. I think it's more of a, um, we think it's a mitochondrial thing. Okay. Thanks for some very interesting perspectives and an excellent talk. Next speaker and last speaker up for this year is, uh, I think you have to introduce yourself, Matt. Yeah. Um, Matt. This is working. Oh, yeah, I would love my slides. Can I have the... Thanks. Okay.
or are we going to stay in, uh, in extreme environments? Is that too loud? Okay. Why wait for it? Do you have more sound? You get the point. Um, well. Good uh, morning, that's the last talk. I'm Matthew Komorowski. I used to be a research fellow at the European Space Agency. I also worked with um, the NASA Human Research Program in, uh, in Houston, in Texas. Um, and these are the people who uh, work on the, on the American side towards the preparation, the medical preparation for future space exploration missions to back to the moon, to Mars, and so on. And now I'm in London now. I'm a senior clinical lecturer and a consultant in intensive care at Imperial College. So we're going to stay in extreme environments, but rather than, rather than a presentation, I'm just going to tell you a story. The story of the first manned mission to Mars. So we're in 2030, and the six brave men have been selected among all of humanity to uh, represent us and make the leap, go, go to Mars. They're all highly trained, highly functional individuals, all middle-aged men, we have three Russians, two Americans, one Dutch. Any Dutch, any Dutch people in the audience? Yeah, yes, exactly. You know this guy, yeah. Andre Kuipers. So he's going to be the main protagonist of the story because he's a medical doctor. Um, so they've they've started the journey. They're they're on the way to Mars. It's going to take 200 days to get there. Then the plan is for them to stay 500 days on the surface. 200 days uh, to on, on the transit to come back home. And this is the official Mars uh, design plan from, from the Constellation program uh, that NASA uh, put up a few years ago. So the thing is, going, going to Mars is not a small feat, uh, certainly from an engineering perspective, but also from a medical point of view. And I think this is really where you, us, as, as medical professionals interested in extreme environments can, can um, make an impact and, and potentially give some uh, valuable input. So let's look at a few of the medical problems that we'll, be have, that we'll have to, to address. First of all, how do you select people? How do you make sure, so regardless of their medical condition, their technical skills, how do you make sure that these people are going to be able to function as individuals and as a whole team for three years locked, locked, in, a, locked in, a, in a tin can. Very, very hard. What about the onboard medical skills? How many doctors do you put on board? Some people say you don't even need a, a doctor at all. If anything bad happens, they're going to die regardless. So it's more valuable to put a pilot, an engineer. Uh, skills redundancy. What do you do if the one doctor you have on board becomes sick, dies? Very difficult. What about the medical kit? Uh, how much consumables you need to bring? Restrictions in terms of weight and, and volume are going to be drastic, absolutely drastic. Currently, to send one kilogram in low Earth orbit, it's uh, $20,000. It's probably going to be 100 times more expensive to send one kilogram to Mars. So uh, don't expect to have an ECMO machine uh, or a dialysis machine, right? Impossible to evacuate, impossible to communicate in real time with Earth. They're going to be on their own. The delay in communication between the Earth and Mars can be anywhere between 4 and 20 minutes, depending on the relative position of the planets, right? Simply because the mission is going to be longer and because they, they're going to be exposed to uh, unique activities, the, the, the risk of uh, critical events that's going to happen is, 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 is just mathematically uh, Im increased. Few, um, a few challenges that we haven't quite solved. 
radiation, three sources of radiation in space. So you have the, the galactic cosmic rays, you have solar particle events, and then you have radiation trapped in the magnetosphere around the Earth. All together, the, the estimates say that you'll, you'll, you'll be exposed to above one sievert during, during a 900-day mission to Mars. So that probably doesn't tell you very much, but it's, it's about 10,000 X-rays equivalent, so more than 100 X-rays per day, per day, because that's, that's even more than what my patients get in, in ICU, uh, <laughs> just by a small margin. Bone loss, 1 to 2 percent of loss of bone mineral density per month at the level of the, the femoral neck, the, the pelvis, so technically after six months you can be osteopenic, slightly osteoporotic. The risk of osteoporotic fracture is, is, is real. Uh, psychiatric conditions, a, a, a huge problem. Uh, if, if you like this, uh, this topic, I encourage you to read 200 Days in Space. This is the, the diary of a Russian cosmonaut called Lebedev. He spent, uh, uh, it's, he spent 211 days in Salyut 7 with one other cosmonaut. They, they all bo got completely bonkers. They, they wanted to kill each other. They went on a strike and so on. It's very, uh, a very striking report. Cardiovascular deconditioning, we'll talk about it. Um, a huge problem. How do we make sure that these people are able to stand up? and to, uh, to, to walk, to function after, after being for six months in, in weightlessness? Very difficult question. Trauma, of course, you know, they're going to be exploring the surface of Mars, uh, potentially falling. Surgical emergencies, another big one. What should we prepare for? There's going to be only one doctor on board. Should this, should this be a surgeon? Uh, you, you probably know, know this picture, right? 1961, we're in Antarctica. This poor guy called Leonid Rogozov, he had to operate on himself for appendicitis. He was stuck in Antarctica during, 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 during the Antarctic winter, uh, and there was no one else to operate on him. So this is the kind of scenarios that we need to prepare for. Uh, what else? Decompression sickness. Whenever, whenever you transition from the, the, the spacecraft, which is normal baric, normal sick, to into, um, into the spacesuit, you, you, you drop the, the barometric pressure to by, by about two-thirds, so there is a risk of uh, hypobaric decompression sickness, a little bit like what happens to divers. Uh, and certainly the, the, the incidence of uh, venous bubbles is very high in hypobaric chambers, probably uh, between 50 and 80 percent of bubbles that, uh, that are detected. Okay, let's say, let's say none of this happens. So far everything is going well, the, the crew is, uh, is in the spacecraft uh, on the way to Mars. What else could happen? Something we haven't talked about. Something that... Pregnancy? <laughs> well, I mean, given the, given the, 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 the population, it's unlikely. I know you're probably not a gynecologist, but... Um, <laughs> anything else? Something very common, we all love. Technical failure, yeah, let's, let's stick to something medical. How about a bad infection? How about good little sepsis? Everybody loves sepsis. So the scenario is that Andre Kuypers, the, the crew doctor, the only doctor on board, gets a pneumonia. And I'll, le I'll let me explain, yeah? So uh, I don't know, do you mind playing this? So this is Andre. He's, he's, he's on the way to Mars. He's speaking, he's speaking back to, uh, to, 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 to Earth about, about his symptoms. Displaying. Okay, excellent. Well, I think we maybe we lost the sound during during the transmission. But what he's saying is that he's becoming more and more breathless. He's going to get antibiotics. His immune system. They're going to fight the bacteria. Okay, and he's going to get better. He's going to get back to his normal self. He's feeling strong. He needs to look good because he's on TV, right? He knows he's going to get to Mars and make the Netherlands proud. So far, so good. The risk of infection in space has actually increased for, for various reasons, pertaining to the immune system of the astronauts, pertaining to micr the microbes themselves, the, the germs. Uh, they may get more uh, virulent. Every, every so often you get reports like this. We found new bacteria on the ISS in the filters. The filters are disgusting. And uh, when they sample, sometimes new bacterial strains appear, some stuff that we don't, we've never seen on, on, on the planet, probably because of radiations. Uh, the vessel is a, is a contained environment, everything is recirculated, there are particles floating in weightlessness that you can inhale with potentially, uh, that p potentially could be contaminated. So the risk of pneumonia, I think, and, and sepsis in general is quite uh, real. 
let's say uh, Andre has to get treated. So the, the, this is, I have a few pictures of the medical kit that's currently on the ASS. This is the crew healthcare system. It's like a, it's like a big cupboard with different packs and sub packs. You have tanks of oxygen available on the ISS, most likely for Mars. That's not going to be good enough. So uh, simply because we're going to need more more than tanks. So maybe an oxygen concentrator could could be could be the solution. You can get uh, I think up to 10 liters per minute, and an FiO2 of 90% with with modern concentrators. This is a picture of the ALS pack that you find on the ISS. You see there's a couple sub packs, little a few tools to, to play with. Four to five liters of intravenous fluids only on the ISS. Okay, don't don't th th that's gonna be another problem. We'll talk about it. The drugs. Uh, this is the American drug pack. Uh, 190 medications, most of them are tablets, very little in the way of injection, very little in the way of the drugs we like to play with, vasopressors, sedatives, strong opioids, uh, muscle blockers, none of that at the moment. So this will have to be updated significantly. Let's say uh, our good friend Andre uh, takes some oral antibiotics. One problem is that the drug stability is impaired in space. This is showing you five different antibiotics. This is an actual experiment that has been conducted on, 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 on the ISS. Five different antibiotics. They uh, stored them for 1,000 days, 900 days, uh, both on the ISS and on Earth. And what you see, they just measured the, the, the percentage of uh, residual activity uh, uh, for each of these medications over time. And what you see is that, uh, so in blue, it's Earth. On red is on the ISS, and you see that it drops more. The, the, drugs, that, the drugs that were sent to space uh, lose their potency faster. <coughs> so that's a, that's a problem potentially for, uh, for Andre, because these are antibiotics, but maybe these antibiotics don't work. And indeed, things do get worse. Andre becomes more septic. The problem is that after having been exposed to microgravity for several weeks or several months, now he's partially deconditioned, and very, very interesting changes occur on, uh, to the cardiovascular system after exposure to, to weightlessness. Uh, this, this has been measured on actual astronauts uh, on, on the ISS via different, different, um, different um, modes, but basically, most likely, there is a decrease in the systolic function of, 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 of the heart. Potentially, the diastolic function is affected as well. The barrel reflex is, is, is deprimed. The VO2 max drops by ab about 20%. <coughs> um, the systemic vascular resistances are also decreased. The volemia, the red blood cell mass, decreased by 10 to 15%. And this is all a reaction of exposure to microgravity. Basically, the cardiovascular system gets set, resets to another set point, which is uh, appropriate to, to, to the load of uh, simply floating in weightlessness. Um, and this, this occurs after, after, after a few days or weeks in, in, in weightlessness. So I think you would agree with me that someone with this profile can be expected to, to tolerate poorly a new sepsis or, or, or a blood loss or induction of general anesthesia or being put on a mechanical ventilator. It is, it is of concern. Of course, it's never been done in space, but it is of concern. Okay, Andre is septic. He needs, to, he needs to lie down on a medical bed. Um, there's no, there's no medical bed on the ISS. This is the closest you have. It's sort of a foldable stretcher. Uh, you can uh, restrain patients on, on this. So Andre na is now immobilized on this. What next? He needs fluids. Okay, there's no, there's no fluids on the ISS, uh, uh, let's say on the, uh, on the way to Mars. It was impossible to bring bags of saline simply because of the shelf life. For three years, it doesn't work. Now, as I thought about that, this is an experiment that was flown a few years ago called IVGen, intravenous fluid generation. They flown this, and what it does, it um, generates intravenous fluids from drinking water, which itself comes from mostly urine and you know recycled uh, humidity in the cabin. So it's an interesting water cycle in it that's going on here. But um, uh, it it it, si it seems to work. Let's say we have fluids. How do you give fluids and weightlessness? Very hard. Okay, here on the left, you see a bag of intravenous fluid in a parabolic flight. Bubbles, so the, 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 the liquid and the gaseous phases don't separate in weightlessness. And obviously, you cannot rely on gravity to, to, to for the fluid to, to, to drop. So that's the current situation, the current solution on the ISS. A peristaltic pump and a little filter. I think they have specific bags with very little bubbles inside as well. Let's say we solve this problem now. Uh, Andre is, let's say, on an IV antibiotics is getting IV fluids. 
this is my slide to remind me to tell you about the, the, the vasopressors. Uh, you've probably seen all those videos of astronauts during the press conference after the flight collapsing. 80% of the astronauts after six months on the ISS have, or I'm just, I'm just going to move forward because it's very disturbing, I'm sure, to, to look at this in, in cycle. Uh, uh, so we'll focus on the 80% of the astronauts after six months on the ISS have symptomatic orthostatic hypotension. They cannot stand up. Because they're hypovolemic, because their adre adrenergic receptors are, are, um, are depressed, downregulated, especially the alpha receptors, meaning if we need to give vasopressors to Andre for his sepsis, maybe he's not going to respond. Maybe he's going to need very high doses. Another specificity of a microgravity exposed patient. <coughs> Next problem, Andre becomes aneuric. What do we do? He's got AKI. Unsurprising, right? What do we do? We know about, about maybe 10% of patients with AKI due to sepsis need dialysis. Do we have a dialysis machine? No. What would you do? We could do, we could do PD, peritoneal dialysis, right? In terms of logistics, it's very simple to do. You just put, some fl put, put a chest tube on in, his, in his peritoneum or whatever, whatever large tube you have. Influx three, four liters of fluid. Let it simmer a little bit, drain it out. That's probably the, 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 the most achievable uh, uh, renal replacement therapy we can hope to, to do. Okay, now he's in multi-organ failure. Okay? You're laughing, you know that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Andre is becoming more and more hypoxic. See this little montage I made just for you. 80% saturation, his respiratory rate is 35, he's still hypo hypotensive, he's becoming drowsy. What, what do we do? What would you do on earth? You would tube that guy, okay? He's got, he's got a bad pneumonia, maybe he's going towards an ARDS. <coughs> to treat or not to treat, that's the question. What's the problem here? If we, if we treat Andre, we're going to use all the consumables we have on, 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 on board. And then for the remaining, uh, you know, 800 days or so, Five people are going to have no consumables in, 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 in if the same medical emergency occurs. Uh, it, is, it is a difficult ethical question. And, uh, you know, the possibility to having to palliate someone with a medical condition like this is very real. And I think this is going to be discussed before the mission. And they, the, these guys are going to give informed consent. But it is possible that at this stage, realistically, he should be palliated. Let's say we don't do this. Oh, another problem I didn't mention is the doctor, right? So non-medical doctors, engineers need to need to treat him. Need to need to be need to become an intensive care doctor. Uh, intubation, in weightlessness, um, and induction of general anesthesia. This is this is the closest uh, picture you'll ever find of someone being intubated in space. But um, if you are interested in this question, this is a, a, a literature review we published last year. We looked at how anesthesia is conducted in austere environments and how we could apply some of this knowledge to to a space mission. There is, uh, there is um, an intubation kit on the ISS. It's, it, it, it's not too bad. Uh, uh, there, there are a few, a few alternatives, a few toys to, to play with. Uh, I believe they also have uh, laryngeal masks now. This was updated in 2011, but I think since there is an LMA. <coughs> Once the patient in tube is tubed, there is a respirator, there is a, a ventilator on, on the ISS. It's very simple. It just uses the, the pressure from the oxygen tank. Two settings, tidal volume, breaths per minute. Okay, so ventilating Andre with this machine is going to be very, very difficult. Let's say we do it. That's, that's, a, very, uh, that's a related study we, we, we did a few years ago. What if there's no doctor on board? What if, what if we need to do just this? Induction of general anesthesia, intubation, but there's no doctor. And we're, let's say we're on Mars or on the way to Mars. So this is a, a simulation study I did at the Mars Desert Research Station. This is the in the middle of Utah funded by the Mars Society. You go there with five other people. You get lock, locked in this little module for, for two weeks. And you, you, you live like you, you, would, you would live if you were on Mars. So you eat. Everything is dehydrated. If you go out, you need to wear those smoke space suits. You, you, there's, no, there's no way of communicating with the outside world. You grow vegetables here. There's a, a, a very nice telescope and so on. So what we did is, uh, the, 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 the research I conducted here is intubation after RSI by non-medical people in this environment. This was the simulation setting, uh, an airway mannequin, 
we were simulating here the, the physiological, the, the physiology of someone who's been exposed to microgravity using a, using a, um, a patient simulator software. And then the only thing that these people had to help themselves was a PowerPoint presentation, PowerPoint checklist. When I, and when I present this to surgeons, they love it because they always say that anesthesia is super easy and that, you know, you don't need to, a donkey could, could, could put someone to sleep. Um, and I have to say, I have to say they did really well. Uh, this is a picture of the crew journalist who is intubating the, the mannequin with an air track. Uh, and there was, there, was no, there was no accident, no, no cardiovascular failure, no cardiac arrest simulated, no, fail, no failed intubation in uh, N equal 5. The limitations are huge, right? I, I, I'm very surprised this got published, but uh, it, it did. You know, if it's published, it's true. <laughs> How about intubating in weightlessness? One, one, step, one step funnier. Uh, there are a few papers on this. Most of these are in parabolic flights. Do you know what a parabolic flight is? You go in a big, big plane. You're at a steady altitude. The pilot pulls the nose of the plane, 45 degree angle, for 20 seconds. You take two Gs for 20, 20, 20 seconds. And then basically they stop the engine and the plane, do it doesn't fall, but it, it kind of follows a parabola, huh? like, like you shoot in a, in, a foot, in a football ball. And it follows this, this sort of trajectory. Uh, for 20, 25 seconds, you're free floating in, 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 in the spacecraft, in the, <laughs> in the plane, sorry. And then, and then the nose dives, and the pilot has to pull the nose back up to, to come back to the s same level, and you take two Gs again. Okay, so it gives you 20, 25 seconds of weightlessness in the middle. And it's very, very disorienting, very, very disturbing. Two Gs is, is, is much harder than you think. Um, two conclusions from these studies. It's nearly impossible to intubate unless... The man, the, unless the patient and the operator are restrained or attached to, to, to the plane. Or you can try this technique, so you <laughs> try um, immobilize the head of the patient between your knees, and try to intubate like this. I, I, I propose you do that uh, next Monday in, 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 your, in the theaters, uh, <laughs> and s say you're doing spaceflight research. <laughs> Nobody's gonna wonder. Uh, okay, these are old studies, right? How about video laryngoscopes? Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, we know that they're, they're much better at uh, intubating. So this is what I did in September uh, with the parabolic flight campaign of the European Space Agency and the French Space Agency. Uh, so we, they have this beautiful A300G. And we had a proposal accepted for doing intubation, comparing video laryngoscope, conventional laryngoscopes, experts versus novice people. And uh, I hope this works. Yes. So I'm going to show you what a parabola looks like. So this is me. This is the mannequin. This is uh, Shemus, is, a, is, a, is a another anesthetist. So this is me using the McGrath video laryngoscope. I don't know if you can hear the, the, the pilot talking, but basically he's, ex he's, he's explaining to everyone what's happening. There is a countdown before he pulls the nose of the plane. Ten. Ten seconds. We're going to lie down because taking two Gs when you're not used to it is very disorienting. So you lie down, and then you take two Gs across this, uh, this, this axis. So now it's, it's pulled the nose of the plane. So the plane is 45 degree angle. There's no window, because if you look, it's very disorienting. The, the, you see the horizon basically, basically co completely changing. It's very disorienting. Injection. They stop the, they stop the engines the plane becomes very quiet. So now we are free floating. You see there are people floating here. We're, s we're, we're attached because otherwise, because for safety reasons, if you're, free if you're floating at the, at the roof of the plane, when, when you go back to 2Gs, you get smashed on the floor. So this is me intubating with a, with a video laryngoscope. Shemus is floating, and then they pull the nose back. 2Gs again. So you have to lie down again. Uh, I had subcut scopolamine double dose, OK? Uh, I, was, I, was, I was so high, I was super high. I, st I still puked, I vomited after, so you do 30 parabolas, after 20 parabolas I was done. I had to, I had to go at the back of the plane with my, with my sick bag. Uh, so then you take two Gs again for 20 seconds, and then the plane is level, and then it's like a normal plane. Let me tell you, it's so disorienting to go from two Gs to basically free floating in, in a fraction of a second. It feels like you're, you're, you're turning in a chair, for, I don't know, 200 rounds per minute, and then you stop suddenly. Like, your vestibular system is completely, completely uh, uh, screwed. It's very, it's very impressive. 
so this is not this is not published yet, but we'll 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 do that we'll do that very soon. You see, we didn't we don't have time to check if the intubation is in place, so we wait. So we do we do the intubation, then we we do the two Gs, and then we check if if the tube is in the right place. You see me? I'm trying to concentrate. I'm looking a bit yellow. Uh, I'm, I'm anyway, that was fun. How how bad can it get? We're nearly there. Remember Andre? Andre is now intubated. He's being looked after by by engineers and, and pilots, and he's very sick, he's in multi-organ failure. What else can go wrong? Okay, Andre can die, okay? He can have a hypoxic cardiac arrest, let's say, or, or, a, or a m simply multi-organ failure. There is an AD on the ISS. If you use the AD, you have to be on the stretcher because you need to isolate electrically the patient from the rest of the station. You don't want to fry the whole station when you, when you shock the patient. So there is an AED. What about CPR in weightlessness? Okay, think about it. Okay, I don't, I don't know how that works. It doesn't work. So, people work on this. <laughs> Interestingly, a few, a few techniques have been, have been proposed. This is the handstand technique, where basically you, 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 you put your foot uh, uh, on, the, on the, 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 other, the other wall of the, of the cabin, and you do, the, you do CPR this way. The reverse bear hug technique, and the evet russo technique, where you, 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 you hold the patient between your legs, and you try to, you try to d deliver any any CPR this way. Unsurprisingly, that, that, does, that doesn't work really well, right? This is, um, this is a comparison study looking at compres uh, compression depth, compression rates. These people got exhausted extremely quickly. After, after 20 seconds, basically, most of them that were done. Uh, sorry, Evet Russomano, handstand, reverse bear hug technique. Uh, very hard to achieve the, the recommended uh, CPR quality by the guidelines. How does this story end? It's just a Hollywood movie where, where everything ends well and uh, he goes back to his lovely wife. No, sadly, Andre dies, okay? He dies because, because th this problem is too hard. Uh, he gets uh, national honors uh, by the king of the Netherlands. Oh, you have a queen now. <laughs> the most, the most uh, uh, aware of you would have noticed that this is not the flag of the Netherlands, but... It's just a little detail. His body gets dumped into space, and his widow uh, uh, is tearful forever. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mathieu, for an excellent talk on space physiology. Um, are there any questions? Just a little detail. So, um, what's the point of a cervical collar in space? Who had the cervical collar? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, you, you're saying the picture on the on the on when the you were CMRS. Yeah. So this is a this picture is from the from the documentation of, on the ISS medical medical kit, and they sh demonstrate that this can be used <laughs> to immobilize someone with a with a with a C-spine injury. I, I, I'm not saying they're up to date with uh, with what we should be doing with cervical collars. But this, uh, you know, this is a few years old, and they're demonstrating a patient with, with spinal injury. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, in the back. This might be a slightly controversial question. All of your astronauts were middle-aged white men. Mm. Was that a coincidence, or is there a psychological, physiological reason that that might be the case? I mean, look at here, it's not the only place where uh, <laughs> the pop population is biased. Uh, I, I mean, this, this is just my... Uh, um, I think it is one possibility that it's going to be only men. It is one possibility that it's going to be only female. It is also possible that the, the crew is going to be mixed. Uh, women do very well in space. Uh, one uh, interesting fact is that there has been experiments of uh, long-term space mission simulations in uh, in confined environments and every uh, okay i have one example where there was a mixed crew and it went really bad uh because because of sexual tensions and and conflicts between uh you know between alpha males and uh um and and they had i think they had to uh, sh shorten the mission partly because of that um so I, I don't have the answer i think it's i think it's a tricky question uh 
but women women uh, are perfectly uh, probably even better than, than men at, at doing some of these tasks okay one more question um, Mathieu, so during that three year flight what's the chance of any of those six crew members getting into that situation where they would actually die what's your calculated risk yeah there are estimates it's very hard obviously because you know the exposure is unique we've n we've never been there we've never done that but there are uh, um, people doing doing epidemiological studies looking at analog populations either uh, from the military or or current astronauts and the risk of a severe medical event requiring you know a surgery intubation and so on is at least one at least one during a three-year mission uh, some people say it could be up to three uh, I, c I can I can share the references with you if, if you're interested, but it, uh, it's very very hard to do to do any anything uh, any any accurate <coughs> any accurate prediction. So um, after he's dead, I hope they wouldn't let the blood go to waste because there's very good uh, uh, data about cadaveric uh, uh, whole blood use. So yes, <laughs> so you would, you you know definitely recycle uh, that, I and you could even centrifuge it probably and then freeze it. <laughs> I had, the plasma, anyway. I had a slide about this and you would have loved it 200% because the point what I was making is trauma is a big concern. There's, no, there's not going to be any blood bank uh, on Mars. So whole fresh blood transfusion is the answer. That means, what does that mean? Meaning that you need to select people on their blood type. Interesting, interesting uh, uh, consequence of, 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 of that fact. Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks everyone again. Okay, everyone, that was the last lecture of this conference. Daniel, Pia Maria, get up here.